It's my pleasure to introduce Professor Sharon Sutton. As you may recall, if you were here during that very first session, the very first panelist, uh, Professor McClung, um, referenced Sharon in her talk. And it's so lovely to be able to come full circle and welcome her here today. Sharon is an activist, educator, and public scholar who promotes inclusivity in the cultural makeup of the city-making professions and in the populations they serve. She's the 12th African-American woman to be licensed to practice architecture in the US. She's the first African-American woman to be promoted to full professor of architecture. She was the second African-American woman to be elected a fellow in the American Institute of Architects and the first African-American woman to be president of the National Architectural Accrediting Board. She's author of a number of books and articles, most recently, When Ivory Towers Were Black, a story about race in America's cities and universities. She's been calling for a rethinking of the culture of architecture schools for at least 30 years. Please help me welcome Professor Sharon Sutton. Good afternoon. Thank you, Dr. Angela Pearson and Professor Anthony Curcio for inviting me to serve as golf chair of creative architecture and keynote speaker for your 2020 conference on rethinking architecture pedagogy. I am thrilled to be among the distinguished group of practitioners and scholars who have held this position. Thank you, Steering Committee, for the Gulf Chair of Creative Architecture Fund for your forward-thinking stewardship of this endowment. Thank you, all my dinner hosts and chauffeurs who want me to make sure I feel comfortable, rested, and nourished while in Oklahoma. Thank you, attendees and students. Are there students here? Oh, better go out and get some more students, uh, to, because the lecture is dedicated to you. And thank you posthumously, Bruce Goff, for your advocacy of the right and potential of each and every one of us to be creative. I'm going to start by telling you a story you already know in order to lay the groundwork for my lecture. So just be patient with me while I tell you this story that you already know. And as I go along, hopefully you will see that there is method in my madness. Bruce Goff was born in 1904, the very year that my mother was born. And he died in 1982 at age 78, two years before she did. He grew up impoverished in what was once envisioned as a state where more than 30 Native American nations were to be confined, beginning his more than 60-year career just as women won the right to vote. Much of his career occurred within a segregated, patriarchal and homophobic society, and in particular within the conservative ethos of Kansas, Oklahoma, and Texas. Yet his writings and interviews with those who knew him confirm that Gulf saw his own idiosyncratic creativity as a deeply engaged, non-hierarchical, social process. This self-taught architect, who became chair of the University of Oklahoma's School of Architecture with only a high school education, was known to listen so intently to his client's aspirations that he was able to create a precise portrait of them in built form. In a 2008 article in Contract Magazine, Tim Murphy wrote that Golf 
and I quote, was the most democratic of architects because he actually believed that architecture was a combination of the individual architect's expression and the individual client's needs, end of quote. Of the 500 buildings he designed, 150 were constructed, mostly houses for private clients, and reflected his belief that clients' needs and prefaces, preferences and the site were his most important design determinants. To understand those needs and preferences, Golf approached his clients as collaborators in the design process. For example, not too long before his death, he wrote an introduction for a portfolio of his work that accompanied an exhibition at the Yellowstone Gallery. In it, he stated that, I do not work for clients, I work with them. Findings from a study that evaluated his lighting design approach confirmed Golf's advocacy of client participation. The study involved interviews with clients, associates, and apprentices and concluded that the high levels of satisfaction clients expressed with their lighting might have been related in part to their active participation in the design process. Thus, in addition to his original forms and use of materials, Golf is distinguished by his principles of working non-hierarchically with others to realize creative ideas. My assignment for this afternoon is to add some ribbons and bows to the discussion you have been having since yesterday about how to teach design students in the 21st century. In honor of Bruce Golf's legacy, let's begin by considering how their world will differ from the one in which he lived and practiced as an egalitarian individualist who valued non-hierarchical collaboration. And I want you to remember that description as I go along, an egalitarian individualist who valued non-hierarchical collaboration. My talk is about 40 minutes, and so we will have lots of time for discussion about the ideas I'm going to put before you. Certainly, today's students will inherit a much more densely populated and urbanized planet. The Earth had six billion people at the beginning of the 21st century, but it will have 11 billion by century's end. Further, Though the Earth's population increases by 90 million every year, just 2 million of the increase occurs in industrialized countries, with the rest taking place in impoverished ones where more and more people will subsist without adequate shelter, clean air, safe drinking water, sanitation or hygiene, all the things the designed environment is supposed to provide. On this densely populated planet, today's students will inherit increasing stratification between moneyed persons and destitute ones. For example, some persons in their potential client base will be highly mobile because they have the economic resources to take business and leisure trips or because they own multiple residences. Others in their potential client base will be highly motivated, mobile because they are homeless, 
are refugees or have been displaced by natural disasters. Some will be well-educated with access to elite decision-making structures, while others will be illiterate and completely disenfranchised. Due to these socioeconomic differences, and also because of the increased global flow of information and people, today's students will inherit higher levels of mistrust and intolerance among different social groups, as is already happening at this moment. As they attempt to create the cities of the future, they will encounter a public besieged by deep sociocultural conflicts, unable to compromise or have a dialogue about living together in what Dr. Martin Luther King Jr. once referred to as one great world house. Today's students will also inherit a planet upon which millions of people are unable to pay the escalating cost of shelter. The gap in housing affordability, which is especially severe in larger cities and in poorer countries, means that worldwide, almost 330 million urban families either live in substandard housing, are paying an inordinate amount of their income for housing, or are homeless altogether. By the time today's students are licensed practitioners, about one half billion urban households worldwide will live in crowded, substandard housing. Nor will trillions of dollars in government subsidies fix the crisis because many residents of poorer countries choose shanty towns over the capriciousness of government-financed housing. These shanty towns lack all the benefits of places planned and designed according to modern codes and regulations, but in many world cities, they exist side by side with lavishly designed high-end residences. Then comes the challenge of vanishing non-renewable resources. The extraction of fossil fuels, minerals, and metal ores from the Earth's surface and their conversion into energy during Gulf's era enabled unimaginable development. At the same time, increasing populations, increasing economic growth, and increasing technological dependence is destroying the world's ecosystems. Today's students will be burdened with the cost of overused and misused resources by previous generations. Their potential client base will live in a world of rolling blackouts, food and water shortages, oceans filled with plastic, denuded forest, and diminished biodiversity. In short, today's students will inherit a planet densely populated by people who are economically and culturally stratified, unable to work together to address such pressing challenges as inadequate housing and homelessness, depleted non-renewable resources, destroyed ecosystems and wildlife, pollution, and vanishing landmass due to climate change. The competencies they will need to work on such a planet are vast. However, in the spirit of Bruce Gulf, I would like to focus on the relational abilities that will help students be creative 
on a culturally divided and ecologically damaged planet. Like many people, Goff saw creativity as an individual pursuit. But clearly, the challenges of tomorrow will require designers who can work across difference, whether with their colleagues, with client groups, or with the public. Even now, most buildings are socially constructed, not just by individual architects, but also by their co-workers, the organizations they work within, clients, consultants, review bodies and funding agencies, policy makers, the public and builders. To realize a design, architects must be able to engage with many different stakeholders over a period of years in order to nurture a project through its many stages of development. For example, consider the National Museum of African American History and Culture, which many people attribute to architect David Frank Adje. However, the idea for this project began in 1915 when black Union Army veterans campaigned for a memorial to honor Negro achievement. That's before Adje was born and 101 years before the building's completion. Congress adopted legislation in 1929 but provided no funding for the monument, so the idea died until after the civil rights movement when debates heated up about whether the federal government should underwrite the museum or whether a white institution could possibly represent black history. At the behest of Congressman John Lewis, President George W. Bush created a commission to study the project 86 years after its conception, which resulted in Congress appropriating funds and authorizing the Smithsonian to adopt the project. The Smithsonian, in turn, established a board of 19 luminaries like Oprah Winfrey, who named a museum director and selected a site on the mall. In 2005, two older pioneer black architects, Philip G. Freelon and J. Max Bond, Jr., formed a partnership with the museum to move the project forward. They completed a 1,200-page, six-volume program specifying both the quantitative and qualitative aspects of a $500 million, 350,000-square-foot museum, thinking it would be their passport to being awarded the commission. Instead, the museum's board used the program to launch an international competition, shortlisting six large partnerships and receiving public testimony on their proposals. Freelon and Bond had expanded their initial partnership to include the up-and-coming Adje. Ultimately, this conglomerate won the competition and began designing the building 94 years after its conception. The building opened in 2016 and became one of the Smithsonian's four most visited museums. The outcome of a design process that required interactions among many different individuals, including a 33-member design team, the staff of four architecture firms, and 31 consultants who collaborated to produce 
2,000 sheets of drawings and 6,000 pages of specifications that were reviewed by multiple agencies, including the Secret Service. The design process of the future will be even more contested and will require enormous interpersonal skills. To get a handle on those skills, consider this continuum of public engagement, which places more conservative, top-down interactions on one end at the left, and more transformative, bottom-up ones at the other end on the right. Top-down engagement often takes the form of public hearings and meetings, while bottom-up engagement often takes the form of public interest projects and somewhere in between are design charrettes and workshops. Let's first take a look at public hearings and meetings and the relational skills they involve. Due to disastrous top-down planning decisions that destroyed as many as 1,600 African-American communities during the urban renewal of the 1950s and 1960s, citizens now must be involved in decisions that affect them. Projects on government-owned land, publicly funded projects, and even private development that affects the public right-of-way require citizen participation, typically through testimony at public hearings and meetings. Architects and other professionals usually serve as appointed members of the boards or commissions that are charged with reviewing such projects. For many years, I was an appointed member of various boards and commissions in Seattle, but I became frustrated that citizens were not actually having much say in redirecting the forces of big development. At some point, I began using the extensive knowledge that I had gained about codes and design review processes to benefit the underdog. I teamed up with a land use attorney, a traffic consultant, and other activist professionals to help workers and residents engage in David and Goliath struggles with large corporations. In one case, we tried to help community members reduce the size of a gargantuan hospital expansion into their working class neighborhood. While the traffic consultant investigated noise and safety issues and a health worker looked into the hospital's record on serving indigent populations, I conducted an extensive site survey, taking photographs of the neighborhood's topography, housing, and luscious landscape. I testified that the expansion failed to take into account these existing conditions and pointed out errors and deceptions in the architect's drawings and models. Up against the hospital's huge team of high-priced attorneys, we lost that one completely. But residents were delighted that they had put up a good fight to protect their quality of life. In another case, we tried to help members of a food workers union in a two-part protest against a very poorly designed building, which included a whole food store that would displace many small businesses. We were successful in getting the design improved, but our protest against the whole food store were written off as a reaction to the size of the building. To counter this impression, 
I developed two design alternatives showing how the street level of the building could be developed with small businesses, which my team and I presented to every council member who would meet with us. We lost that one by just one council member's vote. Meanwhile, the Whole Food store had already agreed to increased health benefits for the workers. Finally, we instructed hotel workers in testifying at design review hearings for what would be the largest hotel on the West Coast. The project had an enormous and distinguished design team, so our strategy was to come up with objections that would slow down the team's progress. We tutored union members on demanding improvements in their work environment, in traffic flow in and out of the complex, and in the number and design of affordable housing units, which were required due to concessions the project had been granted to enable its large size. While the design team was being sent back to the drawing board at a zillion dollars per hour, Union organizers were bargaining for better worker benefits. On this one, we won some and lost some, but like before, the union members were delighted that they had put up a good fight to improve their quality of life. Now let's take a look at workshops and design charrettes and the relational skills they involve in I hope as I'm showing my work that you're thinking about what relational skills I'm using to do these projects. Rather than reacting to what developers have proposed, public participation can generate ideas through hands-on problem solving and consensus building. While mandated participation can hurry up development and prevent legal battles, organizing citizens to imagine and create their surroundings has payoffs in building the shared ideals that are needed to realize complex and costly projects. For example, after at least 20 years of public dialogue, about converting Seattle's industrial waterfront into a recreational park, the city chose James Corner to design the project. Corner scaled back his proposal after citizens and officials criticized it as too grandiose. However, even the scaled back proposal required a 3.3 billion dollar tunnel and a six million dollar annual maintenance budget in addition to the cost of the project. Eventually, Corner's proposal was approved due to the public's shared commitment to creating a recreational waterfront that it had evolved through many design charrettes, one of which I facilitated for the Seattle Design Commission. Charettes reflect a belief that tightly scheduled brainstorming promotes creative consensus building. The most successful charrettes bring factions of a community together to focus mental energy, heighten awareness, and develop an understanding of a difficult, timely problem. In rare circumstances, charrettes can provide a structure for helping large numbers of stakeholders re-examine fundamental beliefs. At the University of Washington, I developed a charrette methodology as director of an interdisciplinary research lab that advanced participatory planning and design. 
the methodology which created a dialogue between university and K-12 students began with architecture students helping public school youth develop design solutions for a problem in their community. The youth would come to the university to present their ideas at the beginning of a week-long charrette. Then architecture students, sometimes joined by landscape architecture and urban planning students, would work with faculty and practitioners to develop those ideas. At the end of the charrette, the students would present their collective work in the community with doctoral students in social work and education evaluating the entire process from the perspective of each of the participant groups, the K-12 youth, the, the university students, the faculty, practitioners, community, and so forth. To give some examples, the Sites of Learning charrette addressed a highway-dominated suburb. It resulted in proposals for improving the pedestrian environment by linking its public schools with residential areas. Over many years, this dialogue resulted in sidewalks being installed around three elementary schools. It also resulted in an outdoor learning laboratory at one of the schools that was designed and built by children, teachers, and parents with the assistance of volunteer students and professionals. The West Seattle Charette addressed how to accommodate growth while maintaining a neighborhood's small town feel. This charrette resulted in drawings that were included in Seattle's neighborhood design guidelines. The Coleman School Charrette took place just after Seattle's Urban League purchased a long-abandoned school in a historically black neighborhood that it intended to develop as an African-American museum with housing. The charrette generated ideas for reconnecting the school property to the surrounding neighborhood and resulted in a doctoral dissertation on community redevelopment practices. Finally, let's take a look at public interest design and the relational skills it involves. Conventional architecture practice depends upon clients who can pay for professional services, which limits architects' ability to address those public needs that are unmet by the private market. Public interest design serves people who cannot afford professional services. It also attempts to address systemic problems in the designed environment and expands architects' capacity to address challenges such as the ones I described at the beginning of the lecture. While at the University of Washington, my students and I teamed up with Donald King Architects, or DKA, to undertake several public interest projects. Through this collaboration, we hope to help stave off the gentrification that Amazon was causing in the city's historically black neighborhood. My students provided design ideas so DKA could provide development services to clients that had little or no wherewithal to pay for them. At the same time, we hope to help DKA as Seattle's largest black-owned architecture firm remain solvent during the 2007-2009 recession as majority firms cannibalized its client's base. In one case, 
graduate architecture students created a rationale for redeveloping an underutilized senior center so the city would not sell off the property to private developers. The students added three types of affordable housing to the property, each with its own funding stream, and re-envisioned the senior center as a resource in a gentrifying community. Their rationale more so than their actual designs, resulted in a $100,000 planning grant for the project. In another case, undergraduate students studied the art forms of the African diaspora in order to generate design concepts for the largest remaining block of the historically black neighborhood. They presented these ideas at various community meetings and after many years of community organizing, the Africa Town Community Land Trust formed and secured a $12 million grant from the city to build affordable housing and related commercial and community uses. So the students planted an idea and then people started talking about it, and they started organizing. The students were long gone, and then finally it resulted in forming a land trust that got this amount of money. At Parsons School of Design, I've begun working with studio instructors to help students develop the relational competencies I have been illustrating. In studios that are sometimes discipline-based and sometimes interdisciplinary, I discuss the challenges and benefits of collaboration and require journaling so students document their own ongoing experiences, which they use to write an opinion piece that takes a stand for or against collaborative design projects. And I really encourage the students to take a stand against collaborative design projects, but only one student had the nerve to do that. At any rate, here are some of the amazing insights students had. Research suggests that diversity heightens creativity because it broadens knowledge and expertise, thereby increasing the number of alternatives people consider. Here's how Ashley Lamb described the outcomes of having diverse worldviews. And these are verbatim, unedited quotes from the students' op-ed pieces. I am part of a four-person team in which each person brings a different angle and background to this challenging assignment. Not only do we call ourselves architect, lighting designer, and interior designer, our life experiences, skill sets, and personal interests differ. All these dualities combine to make our project more complex and hopefully more responsive to diverse community needs. Research also suggests that diversity heightens creativity by bringing together people who approach problems in different ways, with some being logical, sequential thinkers and others being trial and error types who make connections among apparently unrelated ideas. Here's what Sasha Pradham wrote about the outcomes of having diverse thought processes. Collaborative learning at the university, especially in a design program, can enhance the quality of projects and lead to stronger work than any one person could produce individually. While teamwork has often proven difficult and a cause of dispute, one of the most important positives is the transfer of skills and exposure to different approaches 
that can inspire new ways of thinking and problem solving. Research shows that creative thinking results when team members work together in a non-hierarchical, remember that word, a non-hierarchical relationship that helps them feel safe and learn from each other. Positive relational dynamics that you can say described in this way. To be creative, when working on a design team, you should always be prepared to be amazed by your teammates. Each one of them have strengths that you have to be willing to discover and celebrate. No matter how talented you are, when you put yourself in a more non-judgmental and egoless mindset, you will broaden your design abilities. On the other hand, research findings are clear that collaboration frequently results in conflict because people have different values, priorities, communication styles, and incentives. To manage conflict, they may create a shared way of seeing the world or silence contradictory viewpoints rather than risk rocking the boat. The outcome is a shared mindset that may make it easier for people to agree, but that also stifles creativity by blocking perspectives that contradict the mindset. Lizzie Liu, who's the one person who dared to write against collaborative process, described these di detrimental dynamics in the following way. Easygoing personalities lead to group thinking, which in our case caused the design to go in circles without a clear commitment to one direction. Because we always try to incorporate everyone's ideas and unify it into our bigger concept, it takes a long time before we can make any commitment because we don't like rejection of ideas. By the time we had figured out how our team could work most efficiently, midterm had already passed. Despite shortcomings, hopefully these insights into the nature of collaboration have inspired your thinking about how architecture pedagogy might change to prepare aspiring designers to work with a public marked by vast socioeconomic and cultural differences. The relational competencies that I have been describing through the voices of my Parsons students are the ones designers will need to address such pressing challenges as inadequate housing, depleted non-renewable resources, and destroyed ecosystems. As the world's population continues to multiply upon a planet with a decreasing landmass, aspiring designers must have the capacity to help the public envision new relationships with each other and with the earth. They require the competencies to help people envision places that can sustain their livelihoods without destroying the environment, that replace the mechanized processes of agribusiness with land-conserving, labor-intensive food production, that maintain affordability while accommodating the higher densities of an exploding urban population, and that can position housing not as a commodity that produces wealth, but as a fundamental human right. The relational competencies aspiring designers will require are vast. 
but the spirit of Bruce Goff calls upon each and every one of us to be creative in working collaboratively to address the grand challenges of tomorrow. Thank you very much for inviting me to serve as Gulf Chair of Creative Architecture and keynote speaker for this conference and for allowing me to share my ideas about an architecture pedagogy for the future. Thank you very much. Yes. I I think it's not turned on. Or maybe my ears are just plugged up from the Is plane. it on now? <laughs> yes. Okay, now oh, it's now on. Now it's on. Okay. Thank you so much. That was really a phenomenal lecture and just so inspiring and I'm amazed at how you connected it so deeply to one of the things Goff did really well. So thank you. I also just want to um, appreciate like that you put these three different activities on the same playing field in terms of public interest design, which right now is very cool, especially among our students, and then leading workshops in charrettes, which is maybe a little less cool. And then engaging in the process of going to meetings and which is not so cool and i think it's really yeah. refreshing to see those three things as all um wonderful outlets for action right but i want to ask you a question about something okay. slightly different which is the relationship between expertise and collaboration because we've been discussing that a lot at the conference like how do we value our students knowledge and in the examples that you showed, you were bringing your expertise to bear, not just opinions or passion. And I'm just curious to hear if you could reflect a little bit more on um, the role of expertise in collaboration. Is this, is this still, I think this is still turned on, is it? Is it not? Okay, so I don't need to deal with the microphone. You know, we've been talking about that in my studio because I'm, I have, I'm doing a design build studio uh, this semester, and we ha have 12 students. And so when they can't agree, they say, well, we'll let the client design. We'll, we'll, pre we'll present these alternatives, and, and whichever one the client likes. And I said, no, you will not. <laughs> you know, that you have to have confidence in your own expertise to, make, to come to the conclusion about what is your best shot at solving the problem. So I think collaboration is not about you know, giving up your role as the expert. In fact, I think it puts maybe more responsibility on you to know what is, you know, what, is what are you offering, right? And what do you want from the client in order to be able to offer that? So I think collaboration doesn't mean that that you are not the expert. You you have to maintain that. Good question. Thank you. So good to see you. It's not turned on, I think. You have to turn it on. No, no, no. So I, I started many years ago. Can you hear her? Yeah. yeah. OK. Yeah. So many years ago, when I first met you at the University of Michigan, I was Is that when we met? Yes. <laughs> I was okay. a student. I was 24. <laughs> and, I am uh, not that old. <laughs> <laughs> he was very young. <laughs> yes, and um, I was there because I was very interested in getting projects built, and they were so expensive, and operating them was so expensive. So that's why I went to the computing program in Michigan. 
Okay, but, but I'm, I'm going somewhere here. So as I was doing research, I realized that there was, at that time, that was way back in the 80s, that really a major problem we had was assessing process and products, assessing the work that we do. And um, we continue to have this problem. No? The, the, we talk about projects that are delivered on time, that meet the requirements of the client. And then I was just in a session, uh, what, one hour ago, and we were talking about the problem that the students have critiquing each other, you know, peer review and the value of the juries and the critiques. I mean, I'm going a long way, but the, what I'm trying to get to is, you talk to us about some very carefully orchestrated process to um, stop projects that would have very negative implications on the community, but you didn't win. We didn't win. So was the process fail? Were the proposals weak? You know, can, can we talk about that? It looks like assessment is very important. How we do, assess do you mean what was being proposed that we were trying to stop? Uh huh. No, no, no. What you, your counter proposals? Our counter proposals. You failed because they were weak, or N no? As I framed them, they were David and Goliath struggles, and I think that, you know, if you're if you're on the right side of things, if you're if you go with the status quo you have a much better chance of winning. So when I was on the part, when I was on the design commission and just looking, I struggled on the commissions, but basically I was with the status quo. And people who would come in to object, we found ways of got, getting rid of them. So, and it was those people I wanted to give some more power to. So I think when you make the decision that you're going to go against the status quo, you have to expect that you're not going to win. And I ended every one of the stories by saying, but the community was was happy. And, and it was because it gave them a voice, even though they didn't win. I mean, that hospital, they brought 12 attorneys making I don't know how much money per hour against our one little person who was volunteering. <laughs> I mean, it was it was sad, um, but you have to be willing to do that. And I wouldn't. And and you know, afterwards the community had a barbecue and they were celebrating. They lost, but they were they were celebrating that they had organized and done their very best to save their neighborhood. And you know, we we didn't really expect to win. Right. Hi. Thank you for that presentation. <laughs> um, uh, just kind of to speak a little bit on, on what she mentioned. Um, so you worked with these uh, community groups, with unions, these different people to fight against these Goliaths. Um, and in a lot of ways failed, but a lot of ways you, um, you know, offered agency to these people by giving them yeah. some visualization for the things that they needed. Um, how much of, of those lessons that, that you learned and those experiences do you bring into your teaching when, when working with your students on collaborative design and, and these different um, yeah. uh, design projects? How much do I bring into my teaching? Yeah, like do you talk about it with them? Well, I like, do, is it yeah, I, that, that's a really hard question <laughs> to answer off the top of my head. Mm -hmm. um, I do try to help students be willing to be risk takers and also to lose. I think you have you have to be willing to fail. For example, in my teaching, I have to be willing to get bad evaluations. I have, you know, like a whole file full of bad <laughs> evaluations because I know that I'm not teaching what students are expecting to learn in an architecture school. And so it's, you know, there're going to be a few students who are going to say, "Oh, you changed my life. And then there are going to be all these other students who say, radical feminist, you know. <laughs> um, you know, I started as a French horn player. And you miss a lot of notes. So I got used to, to, to having a lot of nerve. 
And I try to share that just with my own personality and by, by teaching, helping students be willing to take risk. I, I'll go back to this um, design build workshop. So we had a client, by the way, the, because I, I can tell I'm going to talk about this workshop because it's on my mind. Um, we are designing a little uh, outdoor pavilion or structure uh, for Weeksville, which is what was the second largest black uh, community in postbellum America. And there are now only four houses that remain of it. And it would have been destroyed completely except some Pratt um, architecture professor who was an airplane pilot was flying over and saw those four houses and they got preserved. So it's a whole kind of heritage center now. And it has a backyard and we're designing this little structure. So our client came to school and we have a big model of the of the historic houses and our little structure. And the client was that happy. Oh, it's, this is nice. You've made so much progress. And so we went back to the studio. And I said, and, and my, my colleagues and I have two co-teachers. I'm the team person, and they're the detail construction people. So we, we agreed that this, the, the project the client was happy with it, but we had not set our standards high enough. And so we said, you know, we have a problem here of how we're going to get 12 people to be creative around one idea. And it's a hard problem, but we'd like for you to spend the weekend trying to t f figure it out. You know, would, would you go with us on this experiment? We want you to work in pairs. And for each of, and we, we, we established kind of the, the fundamental criteria of the project, which we had agreed on with the client. We said, we have these criteria. We want two, two, you to work in pairs and for you each to develop a really lyrical expression of this concept. And they did it. I mean, it took them a week. But they got to something that was so much better. And they, kept the, the, they started saying to me, what if the client doesn't like it? We showed them something. We showed them this. What did we do? I said, I think that they will like it. Take a chance. And if they don't, we can always go back to the boring one. So you know, I think risk taking is, you know, we, we're very focused on getting those A's and the grade point average and the good recommendations. But risk taking is really important. Good evening. Um, Good evening. I wanted to ask a question about social relevancy. So a lot of my work uh, with ACSA uh, is around social relevancy, equity, and diversity uh, in schools of architecture across the country. Um, my question to you is: in the in the three uh, different modes uh, of working and engaging the public, do you find that one of them is um, is more efficient at helping the public understand um, what architects do. Uh, so yesterday, I think it was yesterday, we had a presentation that um, it investigated in a rigorous way the mission of architectural education and came to some conclusion about um, the architect's desire to help people. Um, but we were talking about it and, and kind of came to the idea that people don't know that architects are always there to help them. So uh, my, my curiosity is really about how we inform the public about w what it is that architecture has the potential to do. I'm going to laugh <laughs> <laughs> by doing it. Um, yeah. You know, I've been hearing this story about people don't know what architects do. Universities don't understand architecture schools. Um, I think that's our fault. I think we have to do stuff that's important to people, that improves their lives. 
you know, I, I'm teaching a housing seminar now, and it, it got canceled because I didn't have enough students. And then a little group of students went and organized and put some pressure on the dean, and they agreed to have. There's a housing crisis in New York City. There's 60,000 homeless people, and there's an architecture school, and there are not 12 people who want to learn about housing. I mean, you know, there's, because it's, who, who asked the question about something, something being uh, more interesting and sexier than, yeah, right there, right. Because, you know, we're looking for these kind of smash things that is about our own glory rather than the problems of the built environment that I described at the beginning that are huge. Let's start working on something that has social relevance. And I can't think of anything that's more relevant right now than housing. I mean, you know, you, you have a third of, of, of the, California, New York, Chicago. You, you have space out here, so you probably don't have a housing crisis. But we're, we're talking about a, a nation and a world that has a housing crisis. Um, and that's, you know, that's fun. You, you can't do anything in life without shelter. You can't learn. You can't take care of your family. You can't eat. Housing is the first thing. And we're not paying attention to it. So if we want to be socially relevant, if we want people to understand what architects do, let's do something. You know? Thank you so much for your very clear message and the range of activities that can go under community engagement. And of course, there can be much more that can happen beyond these three. We know in between these three there are ranges. Yeah. Um, I think that what you're saying, students are demanding. And I think that the structures are not there to do them at the scale at which it is needed yeah. so that this approach becomes the Goliath. What can departments, schools, and universities do to make that happen, yeah. and can you also reflect on the tenure process oh. that does not take yes, into account absolutely. these activities that take more time on the time of the faculty yeah. to produce? That is such a good question. That's a whole article, not a... Um, Community engagement is very labor intensive. And you can't really control, talking about risk taking, you can't control the outcome. Like with the design build project, we're, we're worried that if the Historic Preservation Committee doesn't improve this by May, we don't have a build project. We just have a design project. So there's a risk plus the amount of effort, and that universities do not, I mean, more because of, of the work that Boyer did on the scholarship of engagement, uh, that there is more support. Uh, but generally speaking, it's a hard thing. I've, I've been on two uh, search, uh, search committees at Parsons for social justice positions. One is um, assistant professor of social justice and community engagement, and the other one is an associate professor of social justice and art and design. And um, when, when we're interviewing these people, I get concerned that, that we're going to hire this person and this person is going to be the person who does community engagement and makes it all work. And it can't work. It has to be at the, the level that you talked about when you said, what can schools, you know, colleges and universities, it takes all those different levels to make it possible not only for faculty to get promoted uh, and to be rewarded and to be recognized that if they do a studio that's in the community, it's more than the studio that's in the classroom. 
I mean, you've got to have that whole, you know, one of these charrettes that I, I would show you would take me a whole year to organize. Right? So you have to have, you know, a departmental chair, a college that understands that commitment and puts the time into it, that gives you the staff. And then when you go up for promotion and you got to send out for external reviews and the person says, well, where are the articles? You know, where, where are the photographs? Yeah. So, yeah, I, I, um, I just uh, wrote an afterword or epilogue or whatever it was called for a book about, uh, it's written by 10 women architects at the University of Detroit who were hired as kind of the first women in that school. Um, the, the person who wrote the foreword was the first woman, and then I wrote the afterwards, and we actually are colleagues and, and know one another. But I checked out their, um, they, they, the, the point of the book was how you teach architecture in a city that's in decline. And so they described all of their courses. And in the course of you know, my research for doing the afterward, I checked out what each one of the women had accomplished. And hardly any of them made full professor. I mean, you know, it was shocking that they had taken on this really difficult job of teaching in a school in a declining city and taking students out into the community, because th this school has a community design center. So they were kind of affiliated with the community design center. And really doing labor intensive work, and yet not getting a reward. So I, I put it in the article that, uh, you know, it's, it's important work, but it needs institutional validation. Hi, uh, I wanted to thank you for your talk. I'm kind of curious uh, on the collaboration side of things and looking at it maybe through a lens of uh, communication amongst students. I'm wondering if geography plays any role in that and if you've come across any students who have grown up, let's say, in urban dense areas versus students that have maybe grown up in rural, uh, less uh, populated areas and how that kind of plays into their whole process. Yeah. Well, I, I don't have the urban-rural issue, but I do teach in a school that's 43 percent international students. And it's one of the things that we've been talking about on this search is how people would uh, take, you know, a class that's almost half international students who have just gotten to the country, how you develop you know, empathy for what's going on in this country and understanding. And at the same time, utilize those students' potential connections to ethnic communities in New York. So um, I think that's the, the geography is actually talking about social relevance is our main strength because design is so place-based and if you can get people to talk about the places that they know and to develop an understanding across geographies, you know, maybe it will help us to, to somehow be able to communicate. We've gotten to this terrible, uncivil place. You know, how are we going to develop civility when we're so balkanized and rural versus urban, you know, this this culture versus that culture. And the glue is place. The earth, the water, the sh all of the resources that we share. So, you know, I, I'm trying to see it as an opportunity rather than a disadvantage. Um, yes, thank you uh, for Where, your talk. Can I, you hear me? Oh, there you are, okay. <laughs> I have a question that uh, maybe just goes a little bit outside the boundaries. And I was wondering about uh, the reaction of the architects, the professions, about the work we are doing. You know, what's, um, there is some uh, antagonism, uh, jealousy, support, you know, because, you know, we actually somehow get, um, 
getting some of the work that maybe passion was to do it. I was wondering if you got what kind of feedback you got from the architects, you know, for the professionals. Oh, are, are you saying competition, competing with professionals? Yes, we are. You know, we have been doing some works, in, yeah. not to the extent you have done it, but you know, there are some architects that are doing the same work, and then we yeah. are engaging our students, and you know, where we where we where we um, where we set the boundaries. Yeah. And um, so I'm, I was wondering, what's what's your experience on that one? Yeah. Well, that was West Seattle uh, Charette was one that I got into trouble on that because people didn't see that. Uh, usually, bef I, my, my measure of whether students should be doing it is whether the client can pay. And that particular cl uh, community could have paid. And the students got me on it and also professionals of, you know, why are you doing this work? Because this is not a community that needs volunteer services. So I think that that has to be a very um, carefully held principle, that when you involve students and you're using their labor, it has to be for a community that cannot otherwise afford the, the, the architectural services. And then I think there should be no, no conflict. Elaborate. I'm saying that they should not be offered to communities that have the ability to pay. If they have the ability to pay, why use student labor? The student, students are providing a service to communities. If it's community service, it should be to a community that needs service, not to a community that doesn't need service.